So uh, today we will uh, move a bit forward in terms, in many terms, but one term is that let's assume now that we have a, a synthetic speech. We have created, we have learned HMM, we have learned LDM, we have we have learned about DNN, LSTM, uh, how to prepare the databases, do labeling, recording even. You could do that at home uh, with the great uh, hands-on sessions that uh, Simon and uh, Vasilis have prepared. There's also the group here at uh, university on the St. Joseph representations. Probably then you, can, you want to try more uh, advanced vocoders. Okay, so you have done that great work and it works. Well, there are probably here artifacts here and there, probably, but probably you have solved these problems. Prosody might not be that correct, so probably you have to spend more time and we have actually to return back and uh, have a, uh, a summer school only on prosody because it's very important the prosody. You know, we as humans, we, have, we received calls every day, for instance, we communicate with others, and the communication is not that perfect. Uh, over the phone, for instance, there is a lot of noise, but still we can go on if we are interested on the topic of the conversation, we can even go on for one hour. It's not really the artifact, the noise that uh, is annoying us. Of course, um, important in that... Uh, scenario is that we understand what the other person says. Uh, otherwise, we don't want to continue the communication. So, we are robust to some extent, even if noise is present, or even if uh, the decoding of the linear prediction or kelp that our uh, mobile phone does uh, is not that perfect because of X, Y, and Z reasons. But, we are not really robust if, for a long discussion, if prosody is not correct. We are. N this is very important, and indeed, uh, more and more we improve what I, I call segmental quality of speech. We have to pay more attention now into higher level characteristics, and that is the prosody. Prosody is very, very crucial. So I would love to have another summer school just on prosody. But before going there, you have now, as I said, synthesized a nice speech, good prosody, and you want to use that in a real environment. Um, so there is a big possibility that the sound that you will produce will not be fully understandable in a real environment. When I was at at and Labs, we prepared the, what is called at that time was called, uh, was calling the at and Next Generation TTS system. And indeed, it was the Next Generation system at that time, 1998, and it was really very good speech synthesis system. But when we sold that and uh, the software to a company that they wanted to use it in um, at the airport, uh, at the end they have not used it at all because of the reverberation of the ambient noise in the, uh, that exists so much, the noise level in such uh, listening environments. So listening only into your room, in your office, the synthesis system, this is not, it is necessary, but not sufficient. So, today, uh, we will talk about two things. First of all, how you are going to evaluate your synthetic synthesis system, and there is uh, the synthesis, speech synthesis community has developed this blizzard challenge. There's a lot of effort to do that, and the uh, University of Edinburgh really uh, is uh, behind all these challenges. That, was the, that is the Blizzard challenge, and Simon will talk about that uh, during the second hour. But before that, I will present um, work on how to improve the intelligibility of speech in noise. And we can see that, uh, not only for synthetic speech, 
but also for natural speech. So I will talk a lot also about natural speech in order to motivate the discussion. So to see that even if you are perfect in synthesis, perfect in terms free of artifacts, excellent prosody. So natural speech, how does that will be perceived in a noisy environment? How much I can understand from the communication? And uh, I will have the opportunity also to speak about two projects that we were involved. We, we were, one we were involved and one that we will be involved. And actually, uh, Simon is a uh, partner in uh, was and will be partner in, in these two projects. And uh, there we will see another challenge, not the blizzard challenge, the hurricane challenge that uh, also was organized by University of Edinburgh. So, and the second project that we will talk about is, uh, that's why I have put here the word beyond. Now, what that, does that mean? We will see it later. Okay, so I will talk about uh, the LISTA project. That was really a very big uh, in terms of effort, I think, and uh, very big in terms of results that we got uh, for in a European Union project and uh, where we developed the hurricane. We set up the hurricane challenge, so we will see some selected results. One of these results, we will see that uh, when we will see these results, uh, one model, uh, the SSDRC, uh, showed up as a very effective model. So we will see some details about how SSDRC is working and then we will see also how uh, this can be helpful not only on natural speech but all on synthetic speech. Then uh, we will uh, move uh, towards a bit uh, 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 results from last year and this year. So, to talk, uh, so I will talk about more tests that we are, we are doing. And this is a new project that we start and reach, and that is the word beyond. So I will say just um, one, uh, I will just refer to that. So you will, uh, if you are interested, there is a web page, a, a link, the web page where you can get more information, which is supposed to start in October. Okay, so that is, uh, what I'm gonna talk now. So, as I said, I'm talking because I hope, and I, I actually, this is because of me, my Greek accent, not correct English, etc. I'm using also this to un for you to understand me better because that is speech plus text. So, to improve the communication. If I'm talking and nobody understands what I'm saying, why I'm talking? What's the reason? Why I have to do that effort? Hmm? So I have to improve, of course, uh, the way that I'm talking. And even if you are Greeks and I was speaking to you in Greek in a noisy environment, I have to do an effort to speak better. And that, for instance, you know very well that if you go to in a cafeteria, for instance, in a restaurant, you don't speak the same way. Even now, I'm, don't, I'm not talking in the same way as if I talk with you during the, um, a coffee break. So, in a noisy environment, I make a, a, an additional effort. That's why also I cannot talk with you for a long time in a noisy environment. And this is what is called that effort. It's called Lombard effect of a Belgian researcher Lombard who um, studied that effect. Um, now, there is also another different styles of speech. Uh, two important styles are what is called uh, casual, means conversational, uh, spontaneous speech, and also uh, clear speech, clear speech. So when I try to speak clearly, uh, definitely I improve the intelligibility of my voice. And uh, that is true for normal hearing, and this normal hearing, I have to say the following thing, um, can be normal hearing and uh, linguistically experienced lis uh, listeners, but can be also inexperienced listeners. And inexperienced listeners, this does not mean only 
um, foreigners, that people that they have like a second language, English or Greek or whatever, can be also um, kids. Kids are inexperienced listeners. And especially they have uh, special problems to track people, track the voice of a, a human. So, uh, of course, hearing in Perth, you understand why. So, um, this is, these are the a list of communication barriers. And in order to motivate the discussion, I, will, I show you a result first. Now, this picture has a lot of messages and I, I will try to decode this uh, when I will show you more slides, but um, I, just a few things to say in order to motivate again the discussion is that we have done some tests and I will uh, provide you more information about, about this test. And um, we, we, in a noise environment, we try to see the intelligibility of natural speech. And when we try to modify that speech before we put it in a noise environment, that means we do not control the noise. The noise is always constant. The energy of the signals that we do the modifications uh, is always the same as their natural speech, so you do not increase, for instance, the volume. You, you're not allowed to do that modification. And zero means whatever was the score of intelligibility for natural speech. So this is the reference point. Positive means you have improved the intelligibility. Negative means you have decreased the intelligibility. So, the first thing to, to see is that this is a TTS system. So, the TTS system, the synthetic speech, was less intelligible than the uh, natural speech. This is based on HMM uh, speech synthesis system. Even if you work, your database that you learn from uh, is Lombard speech, then the TTS improves but nevertheless, it is less efficient than natural speech. So that shows the problem that I told you, that even if you have a very good synthesizer, you have to pay attention where you are listening. Where are you going to listen to that speech? Now, another result is that, of course, more positive we are, better we are. It's better system. And you can see now this SSDRC that has the better quality uh, the best quality, the best, let's say, intelligibility compared to other systems and, of course, the natural speech, which is zero. So this is something, again, to motivate the discussion and to see where we stand. We will see again this picture later on, but you will have now, um, you, will, you will understand better what, does that, what all these numbers mean. Okay, so we had uh, a project that uh, was from uh, 2010 until 2013. And as I said, uh, Simon, myself, we were partners there, uh, PIs, Bastian Klein at that time from KTH and uh, Martin Cook from Ikerbas in Spain. So, uh, and the, the problem was that we have a machine that talks, but never listens. We, as humans, we talk, but at the same time, I listen or I'm watching you. And then I have a feedback mechanism and I modify my speech. But a machine that talks does not do that. So we are talking about a listening talker. That is from where lista comes from, the listening talker. So we like to make a machine that talks, but at the same time listens. Listen so to the environment. That was the first thing. So in order to do that, we like to learn from humans, how the humans, how, how humans really react to changes in the listening environment. And once we learn that, we will apply it and then we will improve, hopefully, the intelligibility also from machines, from synthetic uh, systems. This was, this still is valid, this uh, link. So if you have more, uh, more interest about Lista, you have to go there. And there you will see also a lot of results uh, from the hurricane challenge. 
Now, that hurricane challenge, the results that I show you to motivate this discussion comes from the hurricane challenge, and that I will talk about more about that. So, we use what are called Harvard uh, data set, like an example of the key you designed will fit the, the lock, and that is uh, phonetically balanced uh, sentences, and uh, in general we can say that they are more representative of everyday speech, as we say here, and however are the data set designed for intelligibility tests. So we had uh, a uh, UK speaker who uh, talked, recorded, uh, very good conditions of recording, and uh, we have downs up to 16 kilohertz, and for the hurricane challenge, just we used the uh, 180 sentences, because uh, this is much bigger, it's 720. Okay, so that was the speech material that we used in Lista. We used also two types of maskers. One was the fluctuating masker, uh, that means a masker, a noise that changes all the time, and that it was a female speaker, uh, that is not by chance. The, the target speaker was male voice and the masker was female, so to make it a bit easier and steady state masker, that is speech-shaped noise, that means we average spectra from speech and then we run noise, and then we have like a constant shh, but has the color of the average spectrum of speech. So these are the SSN and CS that you will see, competing speaker and uh, speech-shaped noise. Now, <coughs> Of course, we have to uh, make sure that when we do this test, people are not allowed to listen twice this, to the same sentence because then they probably they remember the sentence, so it is not fair. So we have to make sure that people listen only once uh, that sentence. Um, here there are some details when you do a listening test. You don't want the, your signal really to start like that when um, just from uh, time zero, you have to have some kind of little noise so to prepare the ear that the sound will come. Otherwise, you have a startup effect and that is not really very good. So, uh, you put if uh, 500 milliseconds are, are enough at the beginning and at the end, so um, to prepare the human for the listening test. Now, we check that the signal to um, uh, uh, the noise ratio, uh, we have decided three levels, and the, uh, I will show you uh, in a minute how we have decided this signal to noise ratios, how to combine the natural speech with the noise, uh, and we decided these SNRs to be where the humans had 75% intelligibility, 50% intelligibility and 25% intelligibility, okay? So then this is the way that we decided these are the three SNRs that we will follow. So now we'll show you a bit that test. That is called baseline results. We were about from 50 native speakers, uh, that means UK, and uh, you see now this is competing speaker. This is speech-shaped noise. So it looks like, and this is the SNR, so um, smaller is the number, harder is the, the condition, and uh, you, you see that we are more robust as humans in the case of competing speaker than the speech-shaped noise. Um, this is probably from the fact that uh, the competing speaker, while it speaks continuously, nevertheless there are some uh, gaps here and there, there is less energy sometimes, yeah, please. To do SNN properly, wouldn't you, in, at least in most cases, have to condition the F0 of your voice to avoid the harmonics being spectrally masked? Mm. The speech-shaped noise, however, does not have any information about the pitch. Just it has uh, the average spectra, so it is something like that. Let's say. And then everything here is noise. 
So it is a constant information over time. Like, shh, so it has no any information about pitch. The other competing speaker has, that is from the female voice, while the target is male. Again, in order to not to make uh, very difficult the task, so we wanted to explore the possibility. So yeah, SSN does not have any information about pitch. Okay. So um, here, so now you can see from where we got 25 percent, minus 20, for instance, 50, something minus 14, and 75 minus 7 for this curve, which we we did. Uh, these are the results that we got, and then we fit a logistic function in this way. So uh, then we can find in which SNRs we are going to work when we uh, have competing speaker. Same thing for speech shaped noise. So now if I invert this, then I can compute uh, the SNR that where I'm working on uh, about regarding the result. Because this is the probability of detection, the P of N. So if now I invert, if I know this, then I can estimate in which SNR I'm working on. And if I do that, and I know also the value for normal speech, when I subtract, then this is called the equivalent intensity change, and it is in dB. What does that mean? It means, for instance, if this is positive, uh, this has done this method has done a very good work. If it is negative, that means this is smaller than this one. Then uh, you have not improved intelligibility. On the contrary, and mainly uh, we will show now. This is EIC, and this is a metric that uh, we have used. And now probably you understand better this number equivalent intensity change. So when it is positive, we improve the intelligibility. When it is negative, um, we uh, don't do very well. So now we see this e, EIC is in, in dB. And let's say this method, SSDRC, is about 5.5 dB. What does that mean? That means that if I first and I make it easier for you and say the I E I C is six dB, you probably know that six dB means doubling the volume. Okay? So if you double the volume, then you have a gain of six dB. So this number here means that if you want, if you are allowed to, because depends on the speakers, to increase to double the volume of the normal speech, then you will have this gain of the intelligibility. So you have to double, almost double the volume of the natural speech in order to match this intelligibility. And you understand now, more you go like that, uh, it, it is good, but not as good as in this area. And again, TTS does not do a very good job especially even, even for Lombard speech, if we learn in uh, Lombard speech, then this is not good. And that was for the case of speech-shaped noise at minus 9 dB. And the listeners to do that was about 140 listeners. Now, we will see some methods from here, but not the details. I will provide more details on the winner, the SSDRC. Okay, so uh, this is not a new problem. People have worked in the past. And for instance, a very effective method is the high pass filtering and amplitude compression. And that is from since 1976. But we have also some models that uh, we measure, that we use to measure intelligibility. And this is, for instance, the speech intelligibility index, SII, is the glimpsey proportion uh, and story, these are uh, some of the models that um, people are using. So if we have such a criterion, we try to optimize, uh, so to modify the speech, so to optimize 
or to min maximize or minimize, depend, on the, the intelligibility criterion. And, um, and another thing is selective enhancement. For instance, Valérie Hazan from UCL found that if you detect nasal sounds and you improve, you increase the volume of the nasal sounds, then the intelligibility is increasing. Same thing from onset and offsets. Why? For obvious reasons. Because of the speech production mechanism, we don't have so much volume uh, from the nasal sounds. Uh, uh, because there are a lot of zeros, so a lot of energy is absorbed and not so much energy goes out. And onsets, when we, I start, I, can, I don't have high volume. The same thing from offsets. So onset and offset, are, however, are very important to distinguish what, are the, what is the word that I'm saying. Mm? So, especially for, uh, yeah, also stops. T -k -p. These are very, very important. If you want to improve the, your intelligibility, you have to pay attention to these three sounds. Okay, so we learned about that, and we know also Lombard effect. Already I have uh, talked about that. What does that mean in terms of signal processing? If we analyze that we, the mid frequencies from three to five, we increase the energy when we talk in a Lombard style. Why? Why three to five? We have learned, this is a feedback mechanism that we learned that that area is the most effective. It's like the opera singer that I sent in the, the first day. Uh, she is trained or he is trained to um, sing in a certain way. The same thing, we are trained every day to see how we will modify our style when we are in a noisy environment. And three to five is the area of your auditory system which is very, very sensitive. That's why, that, what does that mean sensitive? It means that you need the least energy in order to excite it. So, in that area, I will put more of my energy. I will move it from other areas to that area in order to increase the intelligibility. When, for instance, there are clips in the audio, unfortunately, these clips create aliasing frequencies. And the aliasing frequencies occupy that area of 3 to 5 kilohertz. And that's why when there are clips, we, the intelligibility drops. Okay, so that's about... Uh, Lombard speech and signal processing on Lombard speech. Clear speech has also similar characteristics. Uh, we see expanded vowel space. Some people, of course, when you say speak clearly, please, they, they slow down. But if you are trained to speak clearly, then you can uh, uh, even uh, talk faster, but clear. Um, as I said already, about nasals and onsets, I have already mentioned that they have low energy. So these are the observations. So can we use uh, these observations to develop a model? And that is the SSDRC. SSDRC stands for Spectral Shaping and Dynamic Range Compression. So there are two stages. There is the, this, the upper panel is about the spectral shaper. Obviously, uh, if we, these are kind of formants, although you do not detect the formants, but you know that the maxima uh, are very important for uh, your auditory system, so you try to enhance this. And while the valleys are not that important, so if you take energy from the valleys and also from the low frequencies, where already you have a, a lot of energy, and you distribute it to maxima, that is good. Also, when uh, from the Lombard speech, and that is, we can increase the energy at certain frequencies and take them again from uh, the other areas of the spectrum. Why I'm trying to dis redistribute energy? Uh, I have said that, but probably it was, I was not so clear. Because the constraint is, you do all these things, whatever you want to do, to improve the intelligibility, but without increasing the energy, okay? So if you, if you increase from somewhere, you have to decrease it in another place. But all these modifications should be uh, 
somehow dependent on the state of the voice. If it is kind of voiced or unvoiced, you have to pay attention. Otherwise, you will introduce artifacts. And also, when we play back the sound from uh, normal speakers or our headphones or earphones, this, they have also a low pass characteristic. So, but the intelligibility also comes from the high frequencies. So you have to protect your speech to increase, to pre-increase the energy in that frequency, so to protect the loss of the high frequencies. So this is the spectral shaper. Then the dynamic range compression is not new, but you have to know how to design an effective DRC without artifacts. Mainly, DRC works on input envelope, output envelope, then you have an, uh, a correlation, uh, um, um, a function that defines the relationship. When the input envelope, for instance, we are here, we do expansion. Where we are here, we do compression, etc. Yeah, when we are here, this is 45 degrees, we don't do anything. It's just kept constant. And this is mainly when uh, there are silences or very low energy components, which is not from statistics, we know that these are not speech. In order to do the envelope, you have to detect the envelope. So we, you, there are many ways to do it. Uh, you can pick up one, like for instance, Hilbert envelope or other, because all these things, another constraint is, do you want this to be a real-time system? So all the solutions should be real-time if your constraint is to be real-time. So once you have this envelope, then you see where you are. And mainly what is the key here is that in the areas which are like nasals, onsets, and offsets, which are in this area, you will expand. In the areas where you have a lot of energy, like sonorants, A, O, E, it's already high. So you will do compression. So from here, you will get a lot of energy, and you will move it here. OK? So it's like redistributing the uh, wealth eh, of planets in a better way. Uh, I yeah. just have a small clarification. So uh, why does the high pass filtering help us so much? Because given that we are more perceptible to three to five kilohertz range. Uh, you mean uh, this filter here? Yeah, uh, no, the, yeah, that, yeah, the, the high pass filter. Uh, this is, uh, depends now that I have not put any frequency here, but uh, mainly this is to increase, to um, mimic the Lombard effect. So the mid mid so range. That's frequency. kind of like a pre-emphasis thing. That kind of pre-emphasis, kind of pre-emphasis. I, I have the equations just the the, uh, <laughs> the slide uh, laid down. So, so what is your question? My question is: Shouldn't it be more like a bandpass? Bandpass. At three yeah. To five kilo it is. I mean, it here is just graphically. Mm -hmm. I, I have not. Uh, uh, it is kind of bandpass, but the other one is uh, a high pass. High pass, again, because the device, we know that the device that uh, they will play back the sound has low pass characteristics. If, so then you will lose a uh, high frequency are very important. We saw that from 1976, the results, that if you, you, you have high frequencies there, you have more intelligible sound. And you know that also from speech synthesis. When you have better high frequencies, the, the sound is crispier, yeah? it's more crispy. So then why don't we account for that in our actual features in the MEL scale, scale features? You're still giving more importance to the lower frequency features. Mm -hmm. Well, because the low frequencies also are important for the identification of vowels. Yes. So, so you sacrifice one, you lost the other. So now, the, but once you do the first part, the vowels correct, you have now to find out what are you going to do with the high frequencies. It's not any more noise, whatever. It is something there. And our, your ear is very uh, you know, sensitive to this. OK? So this is the big picture of SSDRC. Now, in terms of equations, I will go fast. Uh, first, as I said, speech is not, uh, it cannot be treated in the same way. You have to detect kind of probability of voicing. And based on that probability of voicing, we um, measure this is the third function that can be computed in many ways. For instance, one way to be like capstra, low order capstra. And this is, uh, this is the magnitude spectrum of speech. Hmm? So when you divide by the tilt, you have a tilt-free envelope. 
And then you improve that. You, when you put here the power, mainly where are the peaks, you put them here and you put them in a higher position, okay? Depends, of course, if it is bigger than one or less than one and this kind of thing, but you will find them out. Pre-emphasis, kind of pre-emphasis, is also a, a function of the probability of voicing and is kind of bandpass filter, depending where are these frequencies. And I think in SSDRC, it is, although it is shown here as a high, uh, high pass, uh, depending on this omega and another term that you can put, then it, can, it turn out to be like a band pass or something like that. And then again, a fixed filter to boost high frequencies. So the spectral shaper, you take now this filter, this, this, and this, and you multiply your magnitude spectrum, and that is your modified one. Then you can put the original phase, inverse Fourier transform, overlap and arch, and you have your spectral shaped signal. The dynamic range compression, as I mentioned, first you detect the envelope, and then you have two phases. You have to understand that there are, again, the envelope is not similar when we have attack or we have release. This is very important for the, uh, to separate these two. So you have to, f to have, for instance, to respect the attack because this is very important for the intelligibility. And um, then we have to find this gain to modify our signal. Uh, and this is gonna be the DRC. So how we get this gain is um, we have uh, this envelope uh, the envelope, uh, from that envelope, we estimate the input, as we call it, envelope. And this is a reference um, envelope as it's just a number that uh, it is by design in the DRC. And once you have that, then you compute, this is the input-output relationship now, and gives you the G of N. And that, you put it here and you multiply. And this is the dynamic range compression. How does it look? Here I show only the DRC output because if I do it on spectral shaper, you will not see any difference between the original and the modified. So you can see indeed that these areas are magnified and also nasal sounds are magnified while the sonoran parts are reduced. Okay, so now you have higher chances this nasal sound to be heard. Okay, we do objective evaluation, of course, because when you design this, you have really to pay attention to this E0, to this release constants, attack constants. You have to design your system. So a uh, system that we use with the spectral uh, shape, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, speech intelligibility index, SII, and we showed uh, the result of SSDRC and uh, the contrast of the original signal, and we contrast it with the Bastian Sauer method. Uh, he, Bastian has done excellent work, and many years he was working on this topic. He called it near field uh, speech intelligibility boosting, something like that. He has uh, even the MATLAB code is excellent uh, web page, and um, we were able then to compare on the same data. Uh, on, and Bastian also does, I have forgot to say, that Bastian's method optimizes the modifications uh, uh, to optimize the SII. So it is really an optimization algorithm towards SII. Hmm? So this is for speech-shaped noise. This is the intelligibility. Of course, as the input SNR is increasing, it is easier. And then the intelligibility, the SII is increasing, which means intelligibility is expected to increase. Okay, that is for natural speech. Bastian's method is doing very well, is improving the intelligibility, but SSDRC is doing really a big jump. That is good. What is going on in terms of competing speaker? Uh, this is the dashed line, is the original. The Bastian's method is this one, so it's not doing very well for competing speaker because the, the masker now is changing fast. It's not just 
constant. So it, in short, the optimization is not so robust, it's not so effective. While well, SSDRC uh, continues to be better. But anyway, this is objective evaluation. This, who cares? I mean, this is just to evaluate objectively what you are doing. So you have to do subjective tests. So we have designed the hurricane challenge. And uh, here you can see we had many listeners, which were native UK speakers. We made sure that uh, they can hear very well. And uh, we had, as I said, two maskers, speech shape noise, competing speaker, and three SNR levels. We use Harvard. We make sure that uh, they have not listened to the same sentence, um, etc. So this is very rigorous. Uh, the noise conditions, I mean, 18 was in the room of listening, or it was added to the sample? It was added. It, uh, the, um, yeah, we had clean speech. And then we had measurements of noise, and then we add them together. So, uh, I will show you results on a uh, few data, like normal speech, Lombard. Now, how we created the Lombard speech, we had the same listener, the same speaker. We had headphones, the noise is coming in, and he was recording his voice. So, he was he really uh, producing he was producing Lombard speech. Then uh, a spectral modification methods, two spectral modification methods, one based on Glipsy proportion, and the other is based on SII, the bastian sauer method that I told you, and the suggested method from uh, Catalin. SSDRC. Okay, so here are the results. Four, spectral shaping noise, and competing speaker. This <coughs> zero is always the uh, natural speech. Okay? If you are positive, because this is equivalent intensity gain, you do well. If it is negative, you don't do well. Okay, so we see here Lombard, Lombard, Lombard. The SNR drops. More you go this direction, more difficult it is. So humans can do well, very well, but they give up here. You cannot compete more the noise. Um, for competing speaker is different. We do, we continue to do better Lombard speech as humans. Here you see the GP and SII methods. They do well, but not as well as Lombard. Same thing here, but much better here. The machine beat uh, the human. Um, for competing speaker, however, the picture is a bit strange. For uh, GP, who is doing well, well, but for SII, Bastian South method, we saw that in the objective measures, probably, you saw that it was similar to, to natural speech. It's, get, it's really bad. You have to decrease 2 dB, the, no, the natural speech, by 2 dB, in order to, to get the same intelligibility as the one from SII method, optimized according to SII. So 2 dB lower the volume of, of natural speech in order to have the same intelligibility uh, loss, actually. Now, this method, the colors are not perfect, but nevertheless, this is this. This is SSDRC, and you can see constantly improves the intelligibility. Now, this one here, the GP, uh, is the winner in this case. However, if we measure if this is significant, we can find that this is not significant, while are the others are significant. Um, on synthetic speech, we collaborated with people at the University of Edinburgh, and here are the results. This is normal, natural speech. This is natural speech. This is TTS, and as we go along this axis, the conditions are worse. I mean, the SNR drops. It's more difficult. So you see that as we do that, the TTS output is less and less intelligible. But now, if we apply SSDRC as post-processing filter on 
the synthetic speech, this is what we get. So this becomes like that, this becomes like that, this becomes like that, even better than the natural speech. Of course, if you apply SSDRC on this, then you will have also gains. But nevertheless, that shows how also we can improve the intelligibility of synthetic speech. Now, uh, with um, Toshiba uh, in Japan, we made uh, some tests because all these were near field. But we can do also far field. For instance, imagine that we have a loudspeaker and uh, you want to make an announcement in a big area and outside in the city. So this is called far field. And here we measure, uh, this is the simulation 120 meters away from the speaker, from the loudspeaker. And this is outdoor test with 100 meters and 200 meters. So it shows that indeed the intelligibility is increasing when we use SSDRC contrary to plain, that means uh, unmodified speech. And that has uh, recently has been accepted and it will be, uh, probably it is already available and uh, Masami Akamine was the co-author of that work. Okay, so <clears throat> first conclusions is that SSDRC indeed, it is very, quite nice and effective, provides uh, big gains. A, um, it is robust, no artifacts are generated, and I can show that it is, even for near and far field, is, shows uh, good results, and can be run also in real time. Now, however, when uh, we made all these things, we assumed that the unmodified signal and the modified, we must have the same energy. So, but that is not what the humans perceive because we do not listen by energy. We listen and we, let's say the perceptual energy is called loudness. So, all these results that we have seen is, are under the constraint of equal energy, equal RMS. Now, we developed the same method, but under the constraint of equal loudness. Now, the problem with that is that you have to repeat all these experiments again. <laughs> but nevertheless, that, what does that mean in practice? Here, probably you can keep the same energy, but since you move en uh, energies around, let's say, 3 to 5 kilohertz, then you increase, not, probably not the intelligibility, but the audibility. That it can be a concern. So, because when you listen to two sounds, you say, but that sounds to have more volume. Uh, th that's the problem when you don't consider loudness. But if you equalize loudness, then you listen to two sounds, you have done your modifications, but the two sounds, they do, uh, the one and the other, sound like they have the same, indeed, perceptual energy. Okay? Ah, uh, there is the I, ITU standard which is under discussion to redesign it and there are about five or seven models of intelligibility, perceptual energy, and they are fighting because perceptual energy, energy we know in, from physics, we got that term in signals and we say sum of x squared. What is now the perceptual energy, the loudness, it is an estimation. And there are models like, for instance, a very famous model which is near the ITU standard is uh, Brian Moore's from University of Cambridge uh, model. There are also from uh, Germany, there are also very good models of, of loudness. There is um, loudness measurements, for instance, for broadcasting. And, oh, you know, there are, there are standards. They definitely yeah, they take the energy, but then they measure masking effects, time, frequency domain. They uh, measure effects on inner, um, first of all, uh, outer, middle ear characteristics and inner ear characteristics. And all of these are combined and uh, they have a measurement of loudness, which can be um, one number for a sentence or can be by frame. 
and we have a time varying loudness. And uh, we have now a paper at JASA that talks about how to equalize energy, taking into account the perceptual energy, time varying loudness, and a paper at Interspeech. If you are around there, we will show results on uh, intelligibility using loudness. So and we will show you the loudness model. And the dynamic range compression, yeah. both, yeah. both. So, in terms of when it's using the RMS, it's basically using all of the energy in the spectrum and trying to conserve the energy from your. Yeah, spectrum. you redistribute energy over time and frequency plane. That's what you do. Here, you redistribute energy, but you should not keep the energy the same. You have to keep the perceptual energy the same. It's more constrained here. Okay, so, because again, here, somebody will say, yes, you have done a good job, but you do not increase intelligibility. You increase the audibility. That's different. Hmm? Here, however, if you show good results here, nobody can say about audibility now. Indeed, you touch intelligibility if you have good results under this constraint. In short, in, at, in, at Interspeech, we introduce for first time in this context, uh, equal loudness constraints. And then I believe that we have to repeat, Simon, all the tests that we have done under that constraint. Uh, we will need to provide another EU project for that. <laughs> so these are the results. Uh, here I have plain speech. This is SSDRC. This is normal hearing. We will see another uh, condition. Speech-shaped noise, competing speaker, and there are Plain speech, SSDRC. This is another method that we developed uh, actually at Toshiba uh, in Cambridge, which is inspired in, from this method, TSER, the time domain spectral energy relocation, which is used in the, um, uh, a broadcasting company in Japan, but it is mainly based on Tourisia's work from MIT. And we have done uh, a frequency domain, very fast spectral energy reallocation, and combine it with a dynamic range compression. That means we use that as a new spectral shaper in order to improve SSDRC in the competing speaker case. And indeed, you can see, and this one is, uh, ah, this is uh, another work from uh, Petco and uh, Bastian Klein, uh, published uh, recently. Uh, all the methods for uh, speech-shaped noise, uh, they do well. Eh? They do better than the uh, normal, uh, uh, the, the, the plain speech, the unmodified one. SSDRC and FSER plus DRC is doing very well, better than the others. While you go towards this way, this is easier now, so you reach mainly the ceiling effect, so it's not any more uh, any interest there. Uh, and uh, when we go to competing speaker, the results are more interesting. First of all, we see that this new method that we had uh, outperforms SSDRC. That's good. Uh, this method from Japan and uh, from MIT is, is not doing very well. It's very close to the un, un, uh, um, plain speech, as you can see. But uh, the method from Petco does not do very well especially for the low and medium uh, SNR conditions. These are harder conditions now. This is easier. Okay, which shows equal, under equal loudness, SSDRC and the other method improves not only intelligibility, not only audibility, but intelligibility indeed. Okay? Now, we went to do also with hearing impaired people. So these people don't have hearing aids. They just, they have some problems and they have lost the, uh, the ability to hear effectively the high frequencies. So again, for speech shaped noise, hearing impaired means here. And we do, we improve in this condition, we improve from 50% to nearly 90%, 85%. Amazing. I mean, this person I means get a lot of help based on these results. 
And here, however, the SNRs are not like the ones that we had from um, normal hearing. We make it easier for them. So we all these SNRs, when we say low, medium, the low probably is what was medium for the normal hearing, etc. So we will make a shift. Yeah, so similar trends. It's not necessary to do this, to talk more. Now, we made a lot of things, a lot more tests. Uh, clear, clear to casual speech. We made, uh, actually, we had the PhD who uh, uh, made the hair viva in December. Um, Maria. So, how to move from clear, from uh, casual to clear. And, and uh, synthetic speech, we worked with Daniel Arrow to do um, a modification inside the vocoder before, not as post-processing, but inside the vocoder uh, before synthesizing. Uh, we are doing some uh, very interesting work on uh, special groups, uh, like uh, kids with uh, auditory perception disorder, dyslexia, and uh, this kind of special speciality. Um, Noise-dependent SSDRC. SSDRC is independent of the noise, does not listen, actually. But now if we put an ear on SSDRC, we can listen to the type of noise, and then we can improve further the SSDRC by taking this into account, like optimization algorithms. But we have to do it in a way that does not destroy the quality. And that have been uh, also has been uh, shown at ICASP uh, last year, two years ago. Uh, we made a special session at the Interspeech, and then a special issue in computer speech and language. Uh, it's a second. And we have developed a real-time SSDRC, which has been shown at the uh, show and tell at ICASP. Yes, please. So the noise-dependent SSDRC is is it fair to say that's kind of a combination of the SSN and CS where you... SSN are conditions. So yeah. now SSDRC does not listen, really. That just modifies speech. Right. But uh, if we put an ear on SSDRC, then uh, we will start seeing what, what is the condition. It is speech shape noise. Uh, com so, so the difference might... Uh, I see. So there's non-speech... Noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. yeah maybe can some be measurement noise, speech, error. Can be, yeah. yeah, can be speech noise. Can be anyway. We li we listen to the environment. Then we modify SSDRC accordingly. Oh, yes, please. Uh, you said that special group testing on people with dyslexia. Yes. I'm wondering why that would. I mean, dyslexia is a condition where you can't read. So, speech and noise, um, yeah, I don't know how those two connect. Well, uh, there are theories. I can support some of these theories. Some others are against these theories. Um, I will not go to talk about more, more about these theories, but we can talk during the coffee break. But, indeed, the results on listening tests with... Uh, people without dyslexia and people with dyslexia shows that uh, people with, that, with dyslexia have less intelligibility, um, uh, they have, um, they lose intelligibility compared to the people without dyslexia. Now, why it comes that? It comes also, uh, as I said, kids, even if they are perfect, they, excuse me. Okay, it went away. Okay, so um, kids, even if they don't have any problem, still their auditory system, or actually the brain, has not processed so many sounds to be able to track the teacher, for instance, in a noisy environment. It's much, much... If we have, let's say, 80% intelligibility in a class, they have 40% intelligibility, even without any problem. If they have more problems, they get their intelligibility goes even lower. And dyslexia is one of them, okay? But we have to do more tests to that. Probably in a year from now, well, I will be able to show you more. We had some preliminary results with the University of Edinburgh, by the way, but these were very preliminary. I, I would like to make a bit in a better context, and then I will tell you about that. 
okay? If the theory is good or not. <laughs> okay, now, this is the necessary, but not sufficient again, however. You know, at every level you can say the same thing, necessary, but not sufficient. So that's why we created a new project. That's called <coughs> Enrich, because we are, we are targeting the enriched communication. Okay, intelligibility is good, but not enough. The question is how much listening effort, how much cognitive effort we have put to understand this message. Because you could understand it, but and in a multitasking society, this is very important. So, we are uh, uh, targeting <coughs> 14 projects in many universities. You will see uh, the universities, the partners in this uh, um, link, and mainly the tasks, there are three pillars, reducing the listening effort, not only increase the intelligibility, but reduce also the, the, uh, the listening effort, so there is one more constraint. Um, can we enrich speech? Can we augment speech? In, a certain, in which way to improve, to reduce the listening effort? And benefits for, as I, we said uh, before, individuals and, and groups. So there is a call for PhD. Uh, this program is to train PhDs, so probably it's not for you. But if you know people who are interested, please go, uh, let them know this link. So that we will start um, uh, interviews by Skype, and then we are going to have face-to-face -face meetings in London in November for a final decision. So if uh, you think this is a nice environment uh, to work with, please let your colleagues or your friends know about it. So these are some key papers to read, and some references that uh, I shown during the work is here. That's it. So thank you for your attention. In the demo session, which is in the afternoon, I will show you, I have actually here, but it's time to make a break, uh, a real-time version of SSDRC, uh, among others that I would like to show you. Okay, that is about intelligibility. Questions? More questions? Yes, uh, we will put a barrier, you know, I will put, you know, a number of three questions for you, especially for you, not more. <laughs> I'm kidding, yeah. Uh, please. yeah. Um, can you speak a little more about the subjective evaluation uh, for this? W w was it done with headphones, speakers? Headphones. Yes, so no headphones. It, you did one outdoor test that you mentioned? Yes, that, that was... was Masami, can you comment on that? Because you did that test. Was also the outdoor test uh, with uh, headphones, but simulating the uh, conditions, or was it really, what, what, do you remember? Uh, anyway, I think, um, I have to get back to you on specifics. I think, uh, because we had a reviewer who was asking the exactly the same, it was not you probably. <laughs> there uh, yes. who was uh, asking that, and Catalin, who is the first author, replied after consulting the Toshiba Japan. But I don't remember the answer. Definitely, we used, for all the other tests, Hurricane, etc., we used headphones that I know. Would you consider something more uh, uh, radical than that, like taking the actual samples out into a public space, mm -hmm. uh, crowded? Bar, for example. And yeah, actually, I did that. Yeah. I did that. I did that with uh, my son and then someone else. Yeah. We went to uh, Ingle pub in Cambridge. That was quite noisy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were listening to a story. And in, with in or out, without or within SSDSC. It's, the result is impressive. But you just did that informally amongst yourselves. You didn't have... Yeah. yeah, but you could, you could feel the difference, I yeah. mean, so yeah. obvious the difference. The question, however, the big thing is that this, is, this works on clean speech. Mm -hmm. How does it work on noisy speech? That's another constraint. Mm -hmm. So can you do better? I mean, can you improve the intelligibility of the noisy speech? Then you are face-to-face -face communication, telecommunication, then you can improve also. You have a bigger uh, area of applications. Yes, please. 
Yes, so um, uh, you mentioned uh, briefly about um, also that you tried uh, uh, in the context of synthetic speech uh, tuning the vocoder. Yes. And uh, so could you uh, maybe explain a bit uh, what uh, yeah what what you did and uh, like uh, uh, I think in the work of Tom Wright uh, some years ago he had pretty nice results uh, within this realm of um, tuning the vocoder to work mm. precisely on uh, yeah yeah uh, that was indeed a work that we did with Daniel Eru. Um, from Aholab in uh, Bilbao, in Spain. Uh, uh, Daniel has a uh, sinusoidal uh, representation for speech synthesis, so we redesigned SSDRC uh, to work with the harmonics and do similar things, but inside uh, the vocoder before synthesizing. So it was mainly redesigned the SSDRC, but for a harmonic vocoder. Now, the work that you mentioned about Tuomo, and that there are other people also, Emma, is working also in your lab uh, on, uh, on uh, intelligibility. Uh, they do very well. Uh, I think, however, again, we had here in Hurricane Challenge, we had two challenges. One in-house, the other was, I mean, just the partners of NISTA, the other was uh, uh, open. We had many inputs, and uh, I, uh, the result that I show you are representative. Yeah, and uh, I think those uh, experiments took place before Tuomo's thing, so, but, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think Tuomo had an input there at some, okay. yeah, I think, yeah. It was okay. Yeah. Yes, please. When you are modifying species in this method, would there be any impact on speech naturalness? Aha, uh -huh, that's good. Well, um, when... In uh, of course, I mean the problem, uh, you can, uh, it might, you might have a problem with speech naturalness. Now to what extent, that is the critical point. For instance, these optimization algorithms, if the noise is coming, then you just try to avoid the noise, obviously, and you don't take into account that the modified signal should sound like speech, then that's the problem with the competing speaker case that you saw that these optimization algorithms do not perform very well because they don't take into account the properties of the speech sound. Uh, that will be a PhD actually that I will ex um, examine uh, in Sheffield University that tries to solve this problem. Uh, but that is an example that uh, if you above a certain level, then uh, the results would not be good. Now, if you change the, a bit the quality of the sound, assuming that you are listening in a noisy environment, probably this it will not be noticeable. But I will have I will show you a real time demo here uh, when we will come back from the poster session. Uh, we'll have the demos from industry and lecturers. I will do two demos. One will be fast. It will be this real time demo. So I have the possibility there to decrease or increase the noise environment. And then you will hear the quality change with SSDRC or without SSDRC in a real time. Yes. So you have uh, conducted a lot of uh, subjective studies. How good are the objective instrumental methods for predicting intelligibility for your cases? I would assume rather low performance here. Yeah. Well, um, indeed, SIA is a good measure, uh, but not enough, and that uh, STOI also was another method. And um, uh, Martin Cook from Eicherbask has, uh, at the end, he had a lot of data from uh, Hurricane Challenge, so many evaluations, so many uh, systems. So he came up with a modified version of the Glimpsy Proportion me Method, and indeed he has shown, and STOI also has shown, good correlations, like above 80%, yeah, for these conditions. Okay, thank you very much, and let's make a break, and then, uh, yeah, thank you.